Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 69. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Joseph Campbell. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Indie Film Hustle's Filmmaker Process. We provide filmmakers with professional services to get their films or series funded, finished, and distributed. Some of the services we offer are pitch deck creation, film budgets and schedules, domestic and international sales estimates, legal contract templates, consulting, post-production services, script coverage, professional trailer editing, poster design, film deliverables, and production payroll. To learn more, go to www.filmmakerprocess.com. Today's show is sponsored by a new course called DSLR Video Tips, how to make your video or film more cinematic. It's a new course that I've developed with uh, my co-instructor, Egon Stefan Jr., who's been in the business for probably around 30 years, and you'll hear more about him in the coming weeks on a few other courses that we've worked on together. And I'm really proud of this course, and it really goes into a lot of detail as far as the different things you can do to make your images look more cinematic by using different things and understanding different concepts of, uh, you know, kind of bringing over some of the old film stuff and the film concepts over to DSLR shooting. So if you want a deal, we have it on sale right now for 25 bucks, and you can go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash DSLR. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash DSLR. Let us know what you think of the course, and we have some more stuff coming out in the future. So today's episode, man, I'm so, so, so excited for this episode. You guys are going to get so much info and knowledge off of my guest. His name is Michael Polish. Michael Polish is one half of the Polish brothers who are known for making some amazing uh, independent films. Films like North Fork uh, with Nick Nolte, James Woods, uh, Ben Foster, Daryl Hannah, and a bunch of other movies. It was a wonderful movie. Roger Ebert called it a masterpiece. Um, and it is it's wonderful to watch. And the story behind that movie is even more impressive <laughs> than the movie itself. They came out uh, swinging with their first film, Twin Falls, Idaho, which was a independent film about Siamese uh, conjoined uh, Siamese twins, uh, which is uh, not the easiest thing to get financed, and they'll tell us stories about that. Followed by Jackpot, uh, again North Fork, and then many other films uh, like Big Sur, starring Kate Bosworth, uh, among others. But one of the reasons I really wanted to bring him onto the show is not just to talk about all his early indie indie work, but the specific film that I really wanted to go into with him is his movie called Four Lovers Only. This movie was shot on a basically a zero budget. It was shot basically with him as the director, his brother as one of the stars, and the other star was Stana Katik from Castle Fame with uh, Nathan Fillion on, on ABC. And this movie was has was shot first and foremost on a DSLR back in 2011. So they were kind of the first, if not the first, feature film shot on a DSLR. They shot the entire movie in Paris, France. And Michael goes in deep detail about what kind of gear he used, how he was able to get into like amazing locations uh, and cafes and things like that in France without a permit, without anything like that. So it's guerrilla filmmaking at its finest. But that's all wonderful. And there's a lot of great stories about filmmakers who make these small independent movies. But the wonderful thing about this one is that he actually made money and not chump change mind you real money they've uh reportedly have grossed over half a million dollars on a basically no budget film shot on a dslr it's one of the few films that have been shot on the dslr that's made a lot of money to my knowledge i i might be wrong i'm sure there are others out there but this is the one that i heard of so please if anybody knows of any other dslr movies that have been made that have gone out and made money uh, please let us know in the comments. They were one of the first independent films to actually leverage iTunes, and they sold the majority of that, of all their sales on iTunes. They didn't make any big festival premieres or anything like that. They just kind of 
gorilla did completely. So he tells us the whole story. I really ask him a lot of detailed questions about how he was able to make that movie, along with all this other amazing gems of information. He was so kind uh, to, uh, he spoke to me for almost over an hour and a half, uh, and I was just kept grilling him about questions. So he was such a pleasure to speak to. Uh, and just so giving of his time and of his knowledge and experience. He's been making movies now for, God, over 20 years, I think, at this point. So it's been pretty amazing uh, what he was able to do. So without any further ado, guys, please enjoy my conversation with Michael Polish. I'd like to welcome to the show Michael Polish. Thank you so much for being on the show, man. Appreciate it, Alex. Thank you for having me. So first question I'm going to ask you is, how did you get that part in Hellraiser? Oh man. <laughs> you know, only only indie guru guys like yourself will ask that question. I've been asked that question maybe three times in my whole life. <laughs> and guys that are very serious about cinephiles really understand. I and I was we were doing the movie Twin Falls, Idaho. We were actually researching makeup and how we were gonna bond those two character the two twins together and Gary Tunnicliffe was the effects supervisor on that show and in exchange for him helping us they asked us if we wanted to do a bit part in that Hellraiser. So sort of it was it was sort of a tra- you know a trade, you know, and it was it was great because you got to meet Doug Pinhead and you got to see how these movies were being made, and that's relatively low were low budget movies too mm-hmm. at that point. That was a sequel. That was like what the third sequel or something like that. Fourth, se- yeah, it was Hellraiser Bloodline, right? Yeah, Bloodline, and you um you got to see how long makeup sessions were and and sort of how everybody got together to make something pretty you know pretty special in terms of you have a lot of people create you know do creating a movie that you don't necessarily get to see or hear about all the time right and now when was that that was what the 90s right yeah that was the 90s that was that was last century yeah yeah absolutely so let me ask you what made you want to become a filmmaker you and your brother i was I was from. I was going to high school up in a small town, up in the suburbs of Sacramento, and I was fairly good at drawing, and, and I knew a lot. And I was very, really obsessive about movies and watching movies. And I, from what I can remember, in the seventies, I was in the eighties. I saw just about everything that came out in the theaters, and I would see three or four movies a day, especially in air conditioning times like the summer. We'd probably watch four movies in one in one complex, and then. I didn't have the background in film because there wasn't there was either Super 8 and some there were some 16 cameras around, but it's very difficult to get our hands and to get it all developed. So what I ended up doing was applying to Cal Arts, which is just up in Santa Clarita, with all my drawings and design work, and I and I was able to get into that school right out of high school and th- then get myself fluent in cameras and how it worked and how film worked. So I didn't really get an education. In filmmaking, but I was in an environment which had a lot of filmmakers in it. So you weren't on the track for because Cal Arts is is kind of like a uh, breeding ground for Disney, isn't that? Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, that's true. And there a lot of their a lot of their animation funding and a lot of their staff either worked for Disney or has connections to Disney. And it's a wonderful school for animation. It really is. And Pixar, when I was there, was being born, and a lot of Pixar students, a lot of Pixar today's Pixar. Are the ones running the running Pixar and doing a lot of the films. Very very cool. So I first discovered you uh, when I saw the film North Fork uh, many, many many years ago. What it's absolutely a gorgeous film, by the way. Um, but when I did some research, I found out that the financing fell through a few days before principal photography. Is that true? Well, how did how, how did how in God's green earth did you get? Because that's not a simple little like a couple people in a room movie that's a period it was a period piece yeah the sets were being built and you know you find yourself you're in, you find yourself when you're making a movie and financing falls through that it's it's not that uncommon when you're a filmmaker and that happens you probably should figure out if you survive that you're going to be a group when a group of really good filmmakers that have had this happen to them you're in pretty you're pretty good you're pretty in a pretty good class when that happens however when we were we were up there for about four to four to six weeks, and every set was being built. So we had money being spent, but the the second or, or the third round of money that was supposed to land never never really landed. And so 
we stretched what we could into the first week of principal, but by the second by the second week we were just out of out of funds and so We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. We were having everybody's kind of scramble for money and we ended up borrowing money from, I ended up borrowing a couple hundreds of thousands of dollars from <laughs> that's and, and, and getting the movie finished. I just, we, we just got the movie in the can. It wasn't even, it, we couldn't even get to post. And so what we ended up doing was borrowing that money, coming, flying back from Montana, cutting a teaser trailer that was a little bit longer and then started to show a very rough cut and we showed it to Sony classics, which was the, was the, they released jackpot and they released twin falls, Idaho, their first previous features and paramount classics was and Merrimax. And those, those paramount was having a really good run. And we went and showed Ruth Vitale, who was running there at the time. And she put an offer on the minute the movie ended and, and actually paid exactly what the movie cost and then some. And so we were able to finish the movie with, without having that sort of um, stress of, of, you know, trying to pay that person back. And, and it was a remarkable time and it was a remarkable time, a very stressful time, but, but in the sense of making a movie that we actually wanted to you see on the screen, it's, it was intended. To, it was intended, and it, it, for me, is one of my favorite experiences, regardless of the financial. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, the for everybody who has not seen that movie, I mean, it has an insane cast with Nick Nolte right. and James Woods. So I mean, it's like it's not only did the financing fall through on your independent. It was it was an independent film, right? Basically, it was. I, I believe. We finished. I mean, we got home for about eight hundred thousand. I think we put about eight hundred thousand at that point, and then we finished it for one. Four, I would say roughly between one four and one seven. We ended up. Yeah. 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 No, that was not. Yeah, two thousand two. Yeah, two thousand three. Two thousand three. We filmed it. Two thousand three. It was released, and it, it was. And you know, ironically. Um, I'm accepting a, the Golden Thumb Award that Roger Ebert gives out post Roger Ebert the next week because it was one of his favorite movies. So, yeah, yeah, and that yeah, that was that was when we premiered at Sundance. We premiered at the big theater Eccles, and there's a, I don't know if there's a thousand people can fit in there, maybe twelve hundred. Um, yeah, and we I remember when you have to present it. And we come up, I came up after and, and uh, it was dark and the lights come on and not a single person moved. And, oh God, this is just a disaster. This is a disaster. And, and I'm just standing there, no, and I see this figure walk in the middle of the front, back in the, back in the theater, come up, walk up the stairs, and it was Roger Ebert. And he comes up on the podium and just says, Will you have breakfast with me in the morning? I'll talk to you. And I said, yeah, great. I was, I was so shocked. And then then once he did that, everybody started to raise their hands. Yeah, of course. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. He was... He, he's done that a couple of times in my career. Yeah, that's why I have, a, I have a fairly good relationship with him and I've had a, a great relationship with him because he was... He was such a film fan, and he also protected the people and helped usher people and filmmakers that that he thought that needed other people to understand what they were doing. And he did that. He, he, he would even also tell you that if you missed the target, he thought a couple of my movies met the target, but he said, I can't wait to see, see what you do next. That's a very impressive budget for that kind of period piece movie. I mean, even even back in the night with that. Yeah, back in the night. Oh, no, the 2000s. Those are the 2000s. So coming from an indie world, because you definitely are, you know, definitely all, all, all up until Astronaut Farmer, um, you had never worked with a major studio. So what was that transition from complete control to do whatever you want to working with a studio? How was that experience? Um, you know, we started with Warner Independent, which was 
having fairly much a distributor on board to do that astronaut farmer as sort of a pseudo independent is especially in the early, you know, in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, especially in the late nineties where studios were trying to land grab these before they were being made because they didn't want to get into these bidding wars. I, there was a few mini majors that were setting up and doing their own production so they wouldn't have to go to Sundance or go out in the world and bid for these for these movies because it was just getting very, very expensive for them. It would be easier for them to make these ideas. So we went to Mark Gill, who came over from Merrimax, and he started Warner, Warner Independent Pictures, Warner Independent Productions, and it was called Whip. And we knew Mark from the days when he wanted to do Twin, Twin Falls, Idaho. Yeah. And when we we made it with Whip and we did this movie, it was more money than we've seen to make a movie. You know, we had to build a rocket and we wanted to do special effects. And luckily there was a, a studio executive way high. His name was John, I mean, Jeff Robinoff. And Jeff was able to um, really usher in filmmakers. And he was, he was corralling a lot of early talent, like the Christopher Nolans and, and people like that, the Hughes brothers. And, he found that me and me and Mark could probably do something special with the astronaut farmer. Um, so our relationship with with Jeff and Mark made that movie happen. And what was understanding with Jeff was he said basically, if you see me down in New Mexico and you're filming, you have a problem. If you don't see me, we'll watch the movie when you get back. And it, yeah, and I found in recent years. I found Warner Brothers at that time, or really working with some, that they're pro. They really don't have a, they don't have a lot of say. They would they don't have a lot of finger touching and figuring you know kind of the minutia of everything. They want to see what you do, and if there's a problem, they're gonna they're gonna step in. At least that was my experience with Jeff, um, and I and that was way easier than any independent I ever made, <laughs> and because you had you had the if you had the vision, they had the financing for it. And I think Jeff left a legacy at Warner Brothers to prove it. He proved that very, very right. Yeah. It was Jeff. And when Jeff was with, with Warner Brothers, it was, I think it was a very special time because we saw a lot of, you know, we saw them work with Spike Jones and every, every, he just knew how to corral this, this class that was coming in. I say it was about 90, 97 to 90, Nine and two thousand, he was getting these filmmakers to come to Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I um, you it's know, a different world. It's a different it's, world it's, than that than ninety seven. It's a different, different, real. It's a real different time, and their idea of of um, not being so eclectic. Right, exactly. Is what we're know, seeing and, now. and it's. It's a shame because I mean I mean I'm I I grew up uh, we're both similar vintages so we both kind of grew up around the same time period so I remember when Disney and and Warner's they they would put out a 10 million dollar movie or a 15 million dollar movie and you know and those comedies like Down and Out in Beverly Hills back in the 80s and like What About Bob and uh those kind of movies and they just don't exist anymore it's just like either it's 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 under 5 million or 100 it's like rare to see anything else. Yeah, they they really put that Vegas mentality of betting betting big all the time. You know, that that nickel that nickel and diamond business they just got away from, which you know it's it's understandable when you're running a corporation, but it's not understandable when you're a filmmaker. Right, exactly, and I think uh, you know I think Batman versus Superman is probably one of those examples right now that they've bet the farm on it, and they're. They'll do okay at the end of the day, but I don't think it's what they expected it to be. It's not paying off. It's not paying off exactly the way. And what Spielberg said, you know, the implosion of the Hollywood system. Like, you know, if a, a studio can only do. Imagine if Batman vs Superman made, you know, a hundred million dollars. Like, it, it it would cripple. It could cripple a company. It could it could shut down a studio. And he says a few more of those happen, and it will. I think it will happen. Do you agree? I mean, at, at one point or another, someone's going to make enough mistakes that you know. It's gonna. Be. Well, uh, I, I've, I've, I've always said, when when was a hundred million dollars something that was a bad thing? Right. <laughs> like they would be extremely upset if a hundred million if that movie made a hundred million dollars. Yes. Yeah. When was when was a hundred million dollars a failure? Right. Well, when it cost four hundred. <laughs> yeah, and that and then you have to look at the people that are doing the the 
the finger pointing really goes back to the person that's spending the spending the money. That, you know, having you know having said that, you look you you look at some of the films that do require a lot of money to make, um, like The Martian that was was spectacular to look at, and it was it felt like we were, you know, it felt like that experience of travel, even those movies like Lawrence of Arabia, I just felt you were there. Right. I mean, Blade Runner, Blade Runner two, I don't want for $5 million. I want, I want $150 million in that movie, you know, without, and, you know, and let Ridley do what he does. Uh, you know, that's. Yeah. And yeah. And you, I mean, you look at Fury Road and you see every, you see every penny on the screen and. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And more so because it pays forward in a way that is an experience that all the Mad Max films did. They gave you a world and they gave you and it made you pay attention to another world. Absolutely. And that's a fairy. It should be called Furiosa. Yeah. <laughs> Furiosa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Max says like five words in the whole yeah. movie. Yeah. But the thing that's most amazing to me about that specific movie, now we're just geeking out for a second, but the thing that's the most amazing about Mad Max is that this whole younger generation had no idea that I think what a 70 year old plus director made that. And he is as hip and visually stimulating as any younger director out there, if not more so. Yeah, I, I believe, I believe a later part. Yeah. He's, um, you know, that's, those are the films that got me into filmmaking was the Mad Max, the original that was coming out of Australia. I actually watched when HBO just, was a brand new home box office channel, and there was two of them. I think it was no, there's three. It was Showtime, mm-hmm. um, Cinemax, Cinemax, and HBO, and mm-hmm. they showed Mad Max probably six times a day. And <laughs> yes. I watched and, it, and then the other times they were playing Terminator. And yeah, <laughs> they ended up, Yeah, they ended up. And what was fascinating was how much I learned. You know, it was basically a no man with no name situation going into this world, which is very Sergio Leone. And that's, I would have to say, you know, and then I watched the career, I really watched the career of Mel Gibson and what he was doing because um, he ended up turning out to be a wonderful filmmaker. Oh, well, I mean, Braveheart and, yeah. uh, and even the other one he did right after, um, uh, Apocalypto. Is no, just, that's the one. Oh, yeah, Apocalypto is, is a feast. It is a, f- a visual feast, that movie yeah. and a wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful stuff. Um, so, so I was going to ask you, you've worked with some legendary actors. Right. What advice would you have for directors when they are working with very seasoned actors? Listen, they've been there. They've at least listen to their stories of they've either been in the shot you want to do or know the shot you want to do or acted in the movie you liked. And so you're, you're able to, um, to gain a lot of knowledge before you pull the trigger with these guys and, or, and girls. These these actors are all well seasoned that I've worked with before, and I, I continue to work with a lot of even young, talented actors. That I mean, you treat them the same. You, everybody treats each other the same. Well, you listen to what's going on, and then you're able to direct. Because if you start just shooting around, you're just going to just make a bunch of you're just going to make a bunch of holes. Mm-hmm. And you know, dealing with Nick Nolte on and James Woods are extremely two different type of actors, extremely two different types of personalities. But yet they both have an incredible presence on screen and are able to demand your attention. And if they trust you and what you're doing, it's a walk in the it's 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 a walk in the park. Only it's only a difficult thing when they don't trust you. <laughs> yeah, if an actor doesn't trust you in any level, you're gonna have a hard right. time. Exactly, and the more seasoned, I think, probably the more difficult the situation might be. Yeah, yeah. because they've seen it all. I'm. They've, they've seen it all, you know, with, with most filmmakers, the first thing you hear with these younger filmmakers or people that are just trying out, they usually say, I want to, I want to do something that's never been seen before. I want to do something that's never been seen before. Or I want to put the camera here because it's never, the camera's probably put in every single hole and every mouth and every ear and every building and skyscraper. There's every shot's been made. So do, do the shot that's going to tell the story correctly. Uh, absolutely. Well, I was going to ask you, like, on the first day of set, is there anything you do special when you walk on and, like, because, I mean, I, I know every every movie is a new adventure. So is there a, a thing you do, a ritual? Because uh, I know Coppola, 
Uh, I read somewhere that he does like some sort of like uh, a bonding experience with the whole crew and and does a whole and they eats meat. He makes a meal for everybody and stuff like that. Is there something that you do specifically to kind of get this whole adventure off and it, running? There's nothing specifically I've done because I've known a lot of these mm-hmm. a lot of my crew since we were coming out of Cal Arts. Um, with the actors, I, what I try and do is keep it fairly light and not and don't think I'm going to paint this very heavy with them the very first day. It's just to show them that they're in really good hands. And I might think of maybe coming with a prayer next time. Well, I think, I mean, is there any advice about making an actor feel safe? Because I know that's a big thing with actors. They want to make sure they are in good hands. Is there something that, any advice you can give directors to kind of give that energy out? I always, and you know, I think every director has a special way of communicating mm-hmm. with their actors. And some are very some some directors are actors and some they can express and and I think if you can articulate exactly what you want in a meaningful manner and that they can really get what you're saying and not get too metaphorical with them in certain ways. Um, I, I tend to let the first take, first or second take, be what they what they want to see or what they feel their initial because they've been practicing on their own or they've had rehearsals. They've come in with their whole, you know. Their whole, they have a whole deck of cards they're going to show you. And what your job your job is to do is render it down to see what hand you like. And and that's speaking in metaphorical terms what you don't want to do. <laughs> it's just, you know, I always I always find other ways to explain how to, to communicate. And sometimes you have to use different ways of communication or different methods. But most of the time I like to see the actor perform and and I trust what they're going to do because that's that's their job, and they're really good at it. And they're going to they're going to try and make the best decisions they can make at the moment when you're filming. Now, um, do you? Well, let me ask you a question. They say never to work with family, <laughs> but but not only do you work with your brother, but you also work with your wife. <laughs> right. How do you make working with um, both of them work? <laughs> trust. There's a big trust factor. We're in we're in this business business as family, and we fall in love with the business and and in the in the interpretation when we create, we trust each other that we have each other's best interests when they're performing or when we're writing or when we're directing. Um, you want to you want to make sure that that we're all on the same page, and it's a shorthand when you have family that doesn't mean that that there is not going to be conflict i find i find less conflict with my wife just because <laughs> i have to it's called politics to. i'm married to my friend it's called politics yeah. i have to i have to find less conflict because you don't go home um, and, and lie down next to your brother at night yeah yeah, yeah i'm not i've only been tied <laughs> to him once um yeah i was actually tied to him once and you know through the years we haven't done a lot of projects together in, in the past five years just because our careers took different shapes and shadows and colors um and so i work mainly more with with kate now just because i'm finding that you know i've always loved the leading ladies i've always loved um women that can do you know leading roles and that, that i'm really fascinated just like hitchcock was and all the other you know fincher and all these you find that um if I, you know, if I want to go down that route with, with Kate, I find it really, really um, educational for me. Right. I mean, she's a wonderful, wonderful actress. I mean, and 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 that you have her. And well, it was funny that you have uh, when you were shooting Big Sur. Yeah. I was, and I don't, I, I couldn't believe this, but I literally was driving up the coast, yeah. and I saw the film crew on the side, by the beach. Oh, sh- I'm not. I am not kidding you, because yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I live in LA, so I always see film crews everywhere. But when we were yeah. driving through Big Sur, we were going all the way up to uh, Napa Valley for a little vacation, uh, a baby moon with my wife before our kids, our, my twins were born, and oh, right. and we look, I look over, and I'm like, oh look, there, there's a film crew, and I'm like, it's not like a little film crew, there's. It's a real film crew. And I was like, I wonder what movie's being shot up here. So I later looked it up. I'm like, oh, it's called Big Sur. Michael Polish did that. Yeah. If we were up on the road, we were probably doing some of those scenes where they were driving up and down. Because mm-hmm. we were, you got us on the day, there's probably three days we were actually on Highway 
one, I mean, we were in Big Sur for weeks. I mean, we were down, we were down in the canyon for weeks. Um, but being on the road, we, maybe three days. Right. I saw, I saw the cameras like, go, yeah, they, I think they were, I think maybe getting some ocean shots or. Yeah, we were probably, we were probably near um, Bixby Bridge. Yeah, it was, uh, it's just, it's just ironic. It's funny. <laughs> That's great. Should have stopped by. I wish I, I wish I could have, but we were on our trip to Napa and yeah. the last thing my wife was going to go is like, I don't want to go to another set right now. I just yeah, want to go to Napa. Yeah. You don't want to go to another set, <laughs> especially our set because we were really, we were living like beatniks at that point. <laughs> so one of my favorite films you've done is For Lovers Only. Oh, I, yeah. I absolutely love that movie. And it gave indie filmmakers hope that anyone with a good story and a camera can make an amazing film. Yeah, so that was a that was a that was a very very um, fun movie to make. I mean, so can you please fill in the fill the audience in on how the film came to be and the unique process in which you shot it? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Well, the. Mark and I were talking, we were, we were doing movies back to back with fairly big budgets and it was two, uh, I think it was 2009 when economically films were being funded the way they were used to. Independents are usually funded from outside the studio space and you finding fun, film funds were drying up. We wanted to, you know, we, we already aligned ourselves with a couple of studios and we were writing screenplays at the moment, but we weren't making anything. And we always had this idea to do a, a black and white movie or just a, a French New Wave type cinematic experience, was, which was sort of our tour. We, are, I, we traveled a lot through Europe for all of our movies, and we thought maybe France would be great to shoot in. And he said, well, we have this idea. I said, let's not spend a lot of time trying to make something spectacular because we're not going to have a huge budget. If we all shoot it, I'll, I'll shoot it and I'll direct it and we'll make it a two hander you and we'll find another girl. So we had this story. He had a, a, a idea of a story of having a love affair in Paris. And I said, well, let me get you continue writing and I'll go to Paris and I'll be there for four weeks and I'll scope it all out and I'll get all of the, I'll find locations. So it was a sort of a tandem act going on. He was here in LA writing and I was in, in Paris looking at stuff and I had the, the Canon 5D was fairly new and it was being it was having it was the video component component on it was doing doing the work that most people were shooting small commercials on or you were looking you were just seeing the birth of this DSLR right that was yeah it's gonna happen what I found was if you were using cinema lenses they were a little too big and they weren't mount they were you were having to do another mount and I didn't I really didn't feel like carrying on those type of lenses, so I went in and found these Zeiss lenses that were had the nice focus pull, but they were smaller, like very short lenses. And I was looking at a 50 millimeter, and and I went to when I went to Paris, I was going, you know, this deal, they they look great, but there's something not quite right about it. And when I turned it to black and white, the the grays were very light and milky, and and I go, well, if this is the way it's going to have to look. I'm just going to try and figure this out. So I remember driving around Paris and stacking filters like threes and threes and sixes and nines on these. And I was just making the most dense image I could make in black and white. I was going back to my hotel room and playing this back. I go, wow, we're starting to get to a real black and like a very inky black and white. And I think we're going to get somewhere. And, and, um, and so I called up Mark and I said, I'm ready. I'm going to send you a clip of Paris, what I shot. And you just tell me what you think. And he said, okay. He watched it and he goes, okay, I'll be over there next week. And he said, yeah, but we need a girl. And Stana Kataka, who was on Castle, came in and, and um, we spoke to her. And she goes, I get off the show in like two weeks and I'll come over. And that's basically how that was done. She loved Mark. She loved Mark. No, we didn't tell her. Mark gave her the script on the plane. How, how did you pitch her? He said, like, how did you pitch her? How, and did you guys know her? Or? No, we were. She was at the same agency. We were at. Um, where were we at the time? We were. No, but how did you? Did you like know her? Did you reach out to her? Oh, well, I forget what agency we were at. Yeah, we, we, you're at the same agency. Yeah, we're at the same agency, and they were, gave us a list of actresses that were 
would be willing to actually, it actually was, you're not going to read the script, you're going to go to Paris with the Polish brothers and that's it. Basically, that's what really it's about. So whoever walked in, whoever walked in, yeah, whoever walked in that room was really, really brave. And she was one of them that said, I, she was, I saw you movie Northward and I would do what you guys want. I'm just going to get, you know, I'm going to, she's very polite and very genuine about it. And, and, um, when Mark and her got on the plane, he handed her the script and um, I was already in Paris. And so when they landed, they, they, we, when the minute they landed, we started rolling. And we did it. I shot the film and we were at night. We were doing, which they ended up naming ITs, which we didn't have an IT. We just down, we just downloaded it. <laughs> Download it, right? right. Yeah. yeah. You weren't at the yeah, we were in, yeah. We were just, we were just, I was downloading at night, giving my SD cards a rest and walking around Paris. And we ended up circling the whole country of France. We ended up going to San Michel all the way down to, um, well, even to Monte Carlo and Cannes and, and Nice, and and uh, we did all that within. We did, I think we did it in twelve days. Jesus, that's a hell of a, a hell of a beatnik pace. Yeah, it was. It was a heck of a ride because we had motorcycles and cars, and and it was just me and Mark and Stana, the majority of the time when we were driving around. And then I had an, an assistant named Sean O'Grady, who was um, carrying basically carrying a backpack and, and the sound equipment. Yeah, I was going to ask you, so as with, with far as sound is concerned, did you did you patch it directly into the camera, or did you record it on a location recorder? Both, uh, it was depending on the environment. Um, I did just pretty much a scratch track onto the camera as much as possible because I knew, even though it was tinny and the highs and lows were, were not so good, there was a medium range that if they didn't get excited, we were able to get some some pretty nice dialogue that we could work with. Um, I would say that the film the film ultimately suffered with with some sound, but then it also gave it a feel of authenticity. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't great. I would say now if we're, if we were to do that again, I would just do a two system, you know, all the way around and just have it, have somebody who was mixing them, mixing the sound as we were going along. But then, but then again, um, I wouldn't say that would preclude anybody that's listening not to go do it and put it on your camera. Right. It just it, yes, go especially with the whole mumble core and that that whole yeah. generation of filmmakers that just come out and just like let's just go shoot something. Yeah. Um, now, did you with um, and did you do audio post production at all? Yeah, we did it with a friend of mine that was that was um, his dad um, did North Fork and Astronaut Farmer and did Big Sur did a lot of my recent movies and he was able to take the tracks and clean them up on his own time because we weren't, we weren't paying anybody. Um, so he was, he would take the tracks and spend time cleaning them up and he would do his passes on it. And he also got some students to help with him to do it that were learning sound at the same time. And, and yeah. And the, you know, we had a composer, his name was Kubi, his name is Kubi Unor. I went to CalArts with them and he did some work on with films before. So he was able to bring in really classical we're classically trained musicians to put down tracks in his in his house so he could double up a cello or he could do a trumpet and I found that to be when when all the other crew members and all the other special positions that were doing all the real talented people they pulled they pulled what I did but just with their people you know and that and I feel that that's a, that's a collective and it's also it works when when you're filming people that are going to do what you do. If you can review, what was the equipment took? Just list it off, like the lenses, the camera, the, the, the tripod. I took, um, oh, the, my tripod's genius. I named it Bobo Fett. <laughs> you're a Star Wars fan then. I, I... Yeah, well, it was just so, it, this thing was tough, and it was like a Kubaton, it was like a stealth. It was a monopod that I used to shoot the whole movie, but at the bottom of the monopod, it had a chicken foot. You know, it had three three prongs on it. But mainly, it could stand there by itself, and you wouldn't see it as a traditional tripod. And so you could take the chicken foot off and keep it as a monopod. And this thing was a savior. I still sh I shot with it this last week, and I was I was in Hawaii and I was shooting some some um, surfing stuff, and I think it's had its day. I kind of might have to put it to rest. Oh, I retire it, put it in the yeah. office. I would say Bobo Fett was my thing, and I it, it kept me as a cane. It kept me going through things and 
and I had, the, I had two bodies, I had two cameras, I had two 5Ds, um, but mainly, I would say 90% of that movie was shot on a Zeiss 50mm lens. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. Very wide, and it could go, and you could tuck it up pretty close. Um, I did have an 85, which was probably Stana's close-ups and Mark over the shoulders and some of the stuff from Mark and Stana. It was an 85, but that was as close as I got with an 85. Um, and then a 50. It was basically an 85 and 50 that were Zeiss that I carried around, basically. In my but they were photo lenses, or they were cinema lenses? They, they were photo lenses, but they but Zeiss made these cinema lenses, but they weren't those huge suckers that we're seeing now. They were, I mean, they looked, what's the difference is, is that they have focal points, focal marks. So you're able to actually see when you pull. Oh yeah. So, pull. so the focus is on the side, not on the top. Yeah. Like uh -huh. photography. And, it's, and you can see them, um, but they look exactly like um, still photography lenses. And, and so we ended up doing that. And that was a lot. That was, that was basically one photo backpack that I, it was a backpack that carried my, it was small, but it, the length probably about 24 inches tall, maybe a little less. And I put everything, my clothes, everything in there with the camera. I, I carried that around um, for, for 12 days. I was back on a plane on the 13th day. I mean, I was already there for four weeks scouting it out. Um, but it, what was nice about being in France was going into cafes and shooting scenes. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what's like some of the ridiculous locations you got because you were just in the, you just look like a couple, you know. Yeah, we, and then it was, I always said, I always said I was following them around for their wedding video. If anyone asked. Yeah, I would say they're getting married and we're doing this video because a lot of relatives can't come to France. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's how you stole locations. I love it. But, but. Because at that time, that camera wasn't even flagged for having a video or a component of people. And nobody would think you're ridiculous enough to shoot a movie on that thing. Um, like no one knew. No one knew you were under the radar. Yeah. You know, and I, I still believe that the 5D gets away with a lot more stuff, too. I, I mean, you could probably still pull the levers off the same way. Um, yeah, just because, Yeah. And... And the sensitivity to that camera as opposed to a, a, a video camera is two different worlds still with the common person that, that sees what we're doing. Um, so basically it was, to, it, was, it was, to answer your question um, efficiently, is it was two bodies, two lenses, backpack, and a tripod. Yeah, the monopod. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it, like it looks like a still camera. Yeah, we had, we had, um, forgive me because I don't have the name of it, but it's the cross, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the mic, it's a box mic that has the, the tube. It didn't, um, a lot of people are going to say, they're going to say, God damn it, dumbass mic. You know what you're talking about. It's like, the fact is, I know what I'm, I know what I see. I don't know the words on the, on the machine. And then as far as audio is concerned, yeah. um, you had, I saw a picture that you had a mic plugged into the top. Yeah. That was the recorder that we were we were doing it on these. Um, they were actually the small SD SD cards that we're putting sound on. You were recording on the SD cards and as we were well. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys were really just, I mean, just threw threw caution to the wind, didn't you, on this one? Yo, yo, yeah, yeah. It. It must have been an adventure and a half. You only look, you only, you only, you look brilliant when it's really done. And it's in the theater, but before that, you're just. You're building the roller coaster. Now, with the screenplay, was a lot of it, it was it all written out, or was there a, bu a bunch of improv during that process? I'd say 75% of it, 70 to 75% of that screenplay was written. Okay. The other 25% was, you know, like when they're like putting on makeup in that hotel, or they're going out to, to drink and party, like and going into other people's rooms and actually, that was all, that was done on site. And then you just found it in the edit. Yeah, we found it in the edit. We we were we had a lot of footage like them hanging out. Um, mm -hmm. We'd be in hotel rooms waiting to go downstairs to do a scene, and they'd be sitting in the bathtub, or right. they would be looking at the view, or just hanging out. 
we basically followed two people in love around Europe, I mean, around France, and we were able to, they were so in tune to what they were doing, mm -hmm. that they, lived, they were on vacation, and I was just documenting it. Yeah, they seem to have an insane amount of chemistry. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, was it was wonderful to see. They didn't, they didn't understand that there was a cameraman following them around. They were just there. They were just enjoying it. Mm -hmm. When I watch the movie, it it's almost surreal. The whole pro, the whole imagery, the the whole everything, the the way that the, almost I I don't want to use the word ghostly, but surreal, dreamlike, dreamlike, yeah. very very dreamlike in the sense of the way it was um, percept that uh, like the way it was shot and and just the energy of it. Uh, I feel uh, not to compare the movies, but uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Has oh yeah. Yeah. Has that dreamlike, surreal vibe? They're very different movies, obviously. Yeah. But that I just said was the only film that kind of came to me. Now, with you did this amazing production. You you pushed the envelope. You were like the first feature to ever be made on a five D, or one of the first. Yeah, right? yeah, one of the first. I'd say we're in we're in the, we're in that discussion of being first. At least it was released as one of the first. Which brings me to my next question. You were one of the first independent films that I know of to take full advantage of the VOD and digital distribution platform. Was yeah. that part of your plan? Was there a plan? Well, there was a there was a plan that we wanted to make a movie without restrictions, meaning we didn't feel like we had to go sell this movie at the end of the day or go have distributor meetings. Mm -hmm. Although that would that would be great to have. I mean, we all intend to make our movies to be on the screen and we all, the com compositions are to be on the big screen. However, when we thought of doing a, this, this 5d movie, we thought, you know, we can make something intimate that you could just watch it on your iPad and you could be anywhere and it could, we could just fly it out to wherever you're at. So this movie would have a small run anyways, maybe a five, 10 city theater and nobody would see it. So why don't we just make a deal with an iTunes or, a VOD and zap it out to everybody. And um, this was 2011. Yeah, it was. I, I think it was 2009 when it came out. Right. Yeah, but we did it in 2000. The deal was done in 2010. Right. So 2010 and yeah. 2016 for VOD online is still it was a, a very different world. Yeah. Not nearly as many options. Uh, but iTunes was around, and iTunes was just starting to kind of ramp up. Yeah. Yeah. It. It had. Yeah, it didn't have a lot of on their catalog, mm -hmm. but they were showing, I think, things that were associated with Apple or maybe things were associated with Disney. Not everything was going digital. They were, they were, we gave them the specs and they took the, they took the movie and it was, it was nice because we got invaded by all the fans that heard about the movie. Right. So how did that whole work? Like, how did you, how did you get the word out on the film? Like, how did you market uh, this? Stana had a really big following in, um, in Europe, especially Eastern Europe. There was mm -hmm. some festivals being played. And so we sent the film to a Polish festival and a couple of other, I forget the other festivals. And we didn't even show up, but I believe Stana went to one of them and it was the reverse effect. Word was coming out of Europe that this French new wave was coming to the United States, starring her. So all her fans built this huge, huge following for the film. So when it opened here, people heard about it already. Wow. So it was a reverse yeah, marketing campaign. Reverse marketing without truly knowing. And the audience that she had wanted to see her do a feature film. wanted her to see her in this feature film. I'm a big fan of Stan. I mean, I love, I've watched all the episodes of Castle. I've been a big, big fan of her. She's, she's a lot of fun to work with. Yeah, she's she's a lot of a, a lot of fun, uh, and so you basically were doing something that a lot of people talk about today, including myself, is trying to leverage social media and leverage uh, fan bases of your actors to help sell your independent movie. Right, and yeah, you, they look yeah they look at social media and how many followers do you got? Yeah, exactly. That's like it's it's not like what are your credits like? What's your following? <laughs> Uh, you yeah, how many how many Twitter followers do you have? How many Facebook followers? How many yeah, YouTube? I could. I, I'm just tell you right now, I could not open a movie with my followers. <laughs> I couldn't even. I couldn't make a movie with my followers. <laughs> well, I'll help you with that if you like, sir. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah, you're doing pretty dang good. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. I've been uh, Indie Film Hustle's been around for about seven months, so oh, wow. uh, we've been. Uh, I work 
work it hard. I work it hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hustle. I hustle. No, no question about it. Um, and for people that, uh, and for everyone who doesn't know, I literally just tweeted Michael on Twitter a couple days ago. Yeah, you did. And, and he's like, "Yeah, I can do the hustle. Sure." Yeah. And, and a couple of days later, it's the fastest turnaround for an interview I've ever had. Well, you know, it- we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I've been, I've, I've been where most of these listeners have been, and hopefully they all get to go through a journey that I've been through as an independent filmmaker. I still consider myself a film, you know, an indie guy all the way through, but I never, ever do not say I don't have the time to help, or at least help somebody that, or some advice in that situ, in that situation, because you get some good mentors in this in this industry. And you get a lot of good advice and you get a lot of bad advice at the same time. And, you know, getting down and doing your bare, bare knuckle filmmaking is basically how to get it done. Um, thank you. And thank you for that. We, I, know the, I know the Indie Film Hustle Tribe really appreciates it. Um, now, one other question. This is a, more of a, of a, I guess, a, an actor technical question. Uh-huh. With, with for, lover, for lovers only, since you basically were experimental as far as a SAG, is, a SAG yeah. contract is concerned, how did that work when you actually started making money? Oh, <laughs> I'm sure that was a conversation. That it was a con- It's still a conversation. <laughs> it's a convers. It's a conversation with any union. Uh-huh. I DGA. I w- won't say that they fired me, but in any any, it's it's a tough when you're dealing with unions because I'm I'm aligned with all three of them, so you you can't. Re- you know what I'm gonna. What I would like to say is not really what I'm gonna say, but <laughs> of course, but, fair enough. But, I don't but, I will say, but I will say something about the DGA. They weren't very kind for me going out and making that movie. I've heard that about the DGA. Uh, they have wonderful benefits, and they are a very strong union uh, for directors. But I mean, that's why Robert Rodriguez left. That's why Tarantino and Lucas aren't part of it. You know, but it's interesting uh, that they're there to help directors. But when directors go off and do something like this. Like they they don't allow it or but I think now they're a little bit different. I think they're they're kind of like that ultra low budget. Yeah. Like SAG does now. I think the DJ finally caught up to that. Am I right with that or, or is that still off? They, they they caught up with it. It's I feel it's a still slippery slope with unions because you know every filmmaker has a right to go create whatever they want and if it's not in their parameters or in their guidelines they're gonna they're gonna make a fuss and. And you know the union is good when it comes to benefits and taking care of residuals you a, and stuff. Yeah, and your in your personal side of of your living and what you're and whatnot. But in terms of professional professionally, they haven't seemed to have the. They're not built for renegades or any mavericks or any of anybody that's trying to do something that hasn't been done before. They're not built for that. Right. They're the status quo. Yeah, it's a traditionalism that that I understand because it's romantic and it's great to keep making you know, 10, 20, 30 million dollar movies back to back, but that's not the way the world works. And, and they have to adapt to filmmakers that go this, guess what? I'm going to make a movie for 10 grand and I'll make one for a hundred grand. I'll make one for you can, it's, it's about the filmmakers work at the end of the day and how they're going to provide for them or their family and actually get better because they have to get better at their craft. And sometimes getting a $10 million film school isn't going to work. So, um, so then that conversation with SAG and stuff like, because I'm asking for my own. Now I'm asking selfishly yeah. because I'm yeah. doing low budget films as well, and that whole SAG ultra low budget, uh, you know, or experimental and things like that. I guess that's to a certain point, and then after money starts coming in, then the question, there's the conversation to be had, basically, correct? Yeah, and you know, the the strange the strange thing about that conversation is studios have been making money a long time, and they're not. They don't seem to be going to find them for anything, and everybody's, you know, studios being sued left and right, distributors being for money they said that has been made and that they can't find, or they've put in they said they've lost, and some of the biggest movies you've ever seen are in the red still, and but yet you have the unions coming after the smaller people saying, well, if you make money, we want to see it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, as I say, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard conversation to have with the union that is actually looking for for money and when you do make the money you're so happy you made the money you've probably already spent it <laughs> right <laughs> and they're like where's our money and we're like i don't know what yeah. you, i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about 
It's, you know, what you say, what all filmmakers say, it's called back pay. It's called back pay, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So um, you wrote a book, uh, The Declaration of Independent Filmmaking, which I had no idea about until I started doing research. So I already, it's on order and coming to me, so I can't wait to read oh, yeah. it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah, the book was written, we were being approached because before you and a few other of your of your contemporaries that do podcasts and other people and do this, mm -hmm. this type of, you know, actually goodwill work. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a lot of goodwill work. You had books that were coming out like Robert Rodriguez, you know, El Mariachi and in the making of how to make, a, I remember the big book was how to make a $7,000 movie. Right? Mo yeah, yeah. Yeah. How to make seven or how to make a movie on used car prices. Oh yes. And yes. Mr. Schmidt. Yeah. yeah. And you would see these things, but whether, you know, besides Robert and a few other, you saw a lot of filmmaking manuals that were people that either made one movie or were their professors in school. Yeah. They were making, there wasn't a lot of, I wasn't going to do it after my first movie because I didn't know if I was going to be able to, the second one, the third one. After North Fork and that experience, I felt that we had enough under our belt that we could help other filmmakers not, or actually not do some of the things that we did and actually improve the situation if they were able to understand where we were at and also to say we've had success three times in a row but that doesn't mean we're we're more wealthy or richer we what we do have is knowledge and and those that book is a compilation it leads all the way up to astronaut farmer it stops before we start making astronaut farmer so you see twin falls idaho how's that made and jackpot being the first digital movie because we're using lucas's cameras that he was developing with sony and and then we did North Fork, which was the biggest of all three. But each of them were distributed and were out, and, and at that time was seen as a success. All three films were seen as somewhat of a success, but also they were made under all three different conditions. One was four hundred thousand, one one was I think hundred thousand, and the other one was at the end was a million point something. So you saw a different range of all, all types right. of budgets. And you could talk, you could talk intelligently about all three experiences and you had a, yeah. a range of experience and, to talk about. Yeah. And, it, and with actors, it started out with two unknown, completely unknown people, which were me and my brother doing twin falls, getting into jackpot and using a lot of working actors for that, that were really known just with the actors, which was John Grice. And, and even though Leslie Ann Warren was, is, was there um, there was also Patrick Bouchot who was doing there he was he was doing um, God it was show he was on TV but he was a French new wave actor he was great and so we were able to Garrett Morris who was from SNL so we started to graduate into getting a lot of great act great actors but mm -hmm. not what we would call ones that were going to finance your movie which and then when we got into doing North Fork we ended up working with idols that we saw in Once Upon a Time in America and, and seeing Nick Nolte and, and James Woods. So it was a, you were able to see that we started by putting ourselves in a movie, then you could gradually mm -hmm. cast other people, and then it yeah. was able to get sure. nor, some very notoriety, you know, some big names. And I, those, I think those three movies, I believe, were able to show in every different situation, every situation most people are in, as, even as they are now, what is it like to do a movie when nobody knows you? What's it like to do your second movie when you've had success? It was, you know, it, it really as a culmination of our career wrapped up in a few years was was those three movies. And and you think it's difficult to make your first one. It's harder to make your second one. And then your fifth one, you never think you're going to ever make a movie again. It's, 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 a, it's a constant mental game also that you right. have to understand that don't if you write a screenplay and you hold on to it too long, you say this is my favorite movie. I'm always going to make it. It doesn't get made. You you might be ten years down the road and it's not being made. Best thing you can do is write another screenplay and another screenplay, and keep crafting that because one day one's going to hit. And you say, dang, I have a whole locker full of scripts. Now. <laughs> right. <laughs> As opposed to just having one, which is a big mistake yeah. a lot of filmmakers make. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. I mean, there's still filmmakers today. When I started out in the '90s, still have that are still humping that first screenplay around. Oh Jesus! Now, how did you like? I had a question about Twin Fall Outside Idaho. How did, how much was the budget for that? Just under five hundred thousand. 
how did you get financing for your first movie of a half a million dollars with no did you have have you did you have anything before like did you shoot I mean I, I was I was shoot yeah I had a, I had a few shorts uh -huh. I had um I had a few shorts I had um a, a couple I would say music videos because that was happening and I did one really nice um, sync sound short that I cut and it w went around in festivals. And that was probably, I would say, a calling card for people to say that I could direct a narrative. But We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But what's tricky about doing shorts, and I don't know if it's still the same as today, but back when everybody's making shorts, it wasn't very much a graduation ticket to make a feature because they would say, well, we know you can make a short. Um, are you going to make another short? Or can you make a feature? And the short doesn't tell anybody you can make a feature. It just says you're capable of doing something in a short period of time. And if you like it, then... And so, you f so you, I felt that we were fall we fell on a trap with that short because I would take it around and show it at the DGA. I'd show it to other people and they go, this is really great. What are you doing next? And I said, well, I have a sc screenplay. Um, and it was actually North Fork was the very first screenplay we ever wrote. Um, and they looked at that and they go, you're nuts. You're nuts if you want to make that movie. It's big. It's in Montana. It's on the high plains. And I mean, you're looking at Heaven's Gate right now. I mean, you're looking at you're looking at the second biggest disaster in movie if we give you money for this. For this, and so we wrote Twin Falls, Idaho, and we we knew well if that's going to be too big and if Northwest going to be too big. Let's do something we could actually just get behind. We can be in it. We can actually do it for thousands of dollars. Um, we have the crew. We have the person making the suit. We could actually have pulled off that movie for twenty five thousand dollars. We could have pulled that movie off for that much. And we were getting ready to do it. We were three months out. And our motto was, let's not set a budget, let's set a time. And um, it was around Christmas. And I said, we're going to give ourselves six months to finance this movie. If we don't have a finance for this movie, at least the costume will be built, the locations will be found. I'll get, we were shooting on film. So I said, I'll get cans of short ends. I made all my relationships with Panavision. I made everything with Fuji. I had everything set. And I said, June 1st, we're going to shoot this. Um, in LA. And so we were going ahead and doing it for just whatever we could scrape together. Three, uh, eight weeks, eight weeks before we started to shoot, a financer who was coming out of Seattle was coming down and financing small movies. And one of the ladies named Rena Ronson, now she's a, she's an agent over at William, but now, she, now she's not at William. She started at William Morris. She, her and Cassie and Elways are putting movies together. Um, she said, "You, I want you to meet this. I want you to meet this investor because she's coming to Seattle. She's only here for a couple of days, and they're doing small, small movies. And I think she responded to it. And so, one evening, we drove down. It was right across the street from the the tar, uh, the, 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 the bread tar pits, which was so ironic because you could feel like that's where your career is at at that." <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I know. <laughs> yeah, and it smells like it doesn't smell very good, and my we probably didn't smell very good. And so we just we blended in really well. So we went into this meeting, and the lady read the screenplay and said, "I want to let you guys know something. I have, I think she said I had twins. I have twin sisters. Oh, I understand what this is about, and I would happily like to make this movie for you. Um, do you have a budget? And she was, can you do it for a price? Because I'm because I'm gonna I'm gonna award it like. I'm never going to see this money again because it's crazy to do a movie about twins. twins. <laughs> yeah, it's just nuts. And nobody knows who you guys are. And and nobody's going to want to be in this movie if you even know somebody. Um, so it, it just had everything working. Yes, very, this. Yeah, very much so on paper. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was – when we said we'd do it for the low budget agreement, which was 500 and under, she said you can get it for that agreement. That's that's 50 times more than the money I'm make, doing right now. So we'll figure this out. And within six weeks, we were shooting it. Wow. That's that, yeah. that's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. Right place you know, at the right time. But, you know, but my, my advice to filmmakers is continue like you're just going to make it and do it. Because when the money comes, you're ready to go already. Mm -hmm. You're not waiting for money. Then you're starting up and saying, well, I'm not sure. Get your budget done. 
for what you think you can do it for and understand that you might lock in bigger financing, but see what you can do it for. Get your scheduling down. Get the people that want that you can get for your movie and the timing because you're going to have to, if you want to make it, you're going to have to make it. you got to make something or you're really just going to be at Starbucks or somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we've all been in L.A. For those who don't yeah. live in L.A., if you go to any Starbucks anywhere in Los Angeles at any time of day, there is someone writing a screenplay. Yeah. I think they. I think Starbucks hires them just to sit there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, nah. I'm, I'm really surprised, and this just, I'll, I'll share with you on this. Yeah. You can share with me on this idea. Yeah. Starbucks should probably start naming coffees at a writer at writer's expenses. You know, <laughs> right. I think so. Like this, like this is the final draft cup. This is yeah. <laughs> this is the Charlie Kaufman cup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is Charlie Kaufman cup. Have a have a have a cup of Charlie or have a cup of Kaufman. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, have, have a cup of Robert E. Key. <laughs> yeah. Have yeah, writers the, sponsor. You can have all kinds of. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> it's only in LA though. No, no, it has to be LA based only. Absolutely. Yeah. You couldn't go anywhere, yeah. but like, in, but, but then basically in San Francisco, then you could do tech startups like the Steve jobs. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you the jobs. I think it would work. I think we would work. I mean, we're always looking at other businesses right now, right? Of course, <laughs> just in case this filmmaking thing yeah, doesn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, a quick question about uh, film and digital. You've shot both. Mm-hmm. Where's your heart, and where do you shoot mostly nowadays? I've been. My last feature was on the Alexa, which I found, you know, beautifully fast and slow, and has a lot of um. Mm-hmm. A lot of low light love. Low light love and. It just, yeah, it just has a lot. It just has. They've done a really good job with the Alexa. I shot four features on the Red and the Epic. Did Big Sur on the Red and, and for the Epic, and it was, it was a beast. It was great. It took. It was. It has some really, really great things about it. I, I shot my first. Well, Twin Falls was 35 millimeter. Jackpot was digital, and North Fork was was um was filming it i found that um you know the story should dictate what you want to see but now the, the digital is where it's at there's no reason why you, why you shouldn't be doing it um i was sitting with erwin winkler last or a couple weeks ago and erwin who was just finishing martin scorsese's movie said to me mm-hmm. oh, oh yeah the new, the one's coming out this uh, yeah, yeah the silence of December. i think it's called yeah 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 he said is that the one with the De Niro and DiCaprio together? I'm not sure, but it was it was shot in in um, Asia. And in film, I'm assuming. Yeah, and he goes, you know, Marty shot some on film and some on digital, and I'm not quite sure why he wanted to do um, why he wanted to do digital for some, or why he wanted to do spy. He goes, hell, I don't know why you do it. And then when we show it to him, he can't tell the difference right now anyway, so I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> and I, I just, I laugh because, you know, you have a legend like, um, you have the, you have a legend like that who speaks to an, about another legend, and it feels as common as this conversation. If you're, if you're in the room to listen to it, they're talking about the same thing we're talking about. And they're having just as much fun and, and jokes about it. And, and yet it's a common thing to talk about this world being digital and, and film and some holding on to this romantic part. It's, it's, it, it, when you look at the what film, the emulsion process, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, it's, it's, ma- it's really magical. I mean, I, 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 I've, I've shot 35, I've shot 16, I've shot 8. And it is a, there is something magical about celluloid, and there's a lot of filmmakers who are are fighting very hard to keep it. I mean, Star Wars yeah. was shot 35, yeah. and and it it's actually making a slight comeback now. I've actually seen. I'm working on. Uh, I own a post house as well, and uh, I'm working on a film right now that was shot on Super 16 uh, independently. You know, they shot it because they wanted to get that look, like the wrestler had the look, and Black Swan. Those were all shot Super 16, but it's starting to come back, and it's funny that. I was talking to a couple of buddies of mine over at the ASC, and they're like, "We can't find anybody to load mags. Like, there's just there's no the generation that is coming up has no understanding about loading a mag or film or any. And it's like it's I'm like really like <laughs> the AC your the ACs are just it's a it's a just 
they're either moving, nothing's really moving sideways. It's just moving vertical and everything's going up. And, you know, the when you had that film bag and you had the guy sticking his arms in there, oh, and loading. Scary. You know, and, and yeah, and then they would, you say, you know, check the gate, which was a term which they still sometimes say it just as a joke right. or, you know, let's check the gate or. For those who don't know what that term means, it means to check the gate to make sure that there wasn't a hair that got caught yeah. in the frame because sometimes you can shoot three or four takes, and if there's a hair in the gate, forget about it. we got to reshoot it, and all those takes are gone. Now, digitally, you could fix that if, you, if there was a yeah. major issue. But We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. It's, it's interesting. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm... Maybe I'll shoot film again one day, uh, but I do love the speed of digital and the quality of digital, to be honest with you. And the Alexa is a gorgeous camera, and I've shot a lot of red, too. Yeah, you know, once these film historians that have fallen in love with film, they do, you know, end up taking the negative and digitizing it and working in post and, and manipulating it. They're not truly taking it to a chemical situation in that w- unless they're going to release it, but they don't do an inner negative or an inner positive. No, nah, that's it, all gone. It's so there's a the actual shooting part. I understand, but right after it gets out, gets to the laboratory, it goes back to what we're doing. It's done. Yeah, it's just the it's just a recording medium now. It's not yeah. a full circle. I mean, you remember when DI was the big thing with Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yeah. And like now, it's every single movie has to go through di yeah uh before and I, and I try to explain to people sometimes it was a chemical like how did they color before i'm like oh the dp went into the lab yeah <laughs> they just did, they did it and you're and you're dealing with baths and you're dealing with with you know three colors or four colors and you're right. a little bit more yellow there a little bit more, a little and, more uh, blue. yeah and they, <laughs> when you had you know the funny thing about north work was it's presumed to look like a black and white movie. And, I mean, people look at it and they think it's black and white because it's saturated. Yeah. yeah, we flashed the negative. Or fl- we actually flashed the negative in the camera, and then Did we skip and we skipped the bleach that left more silver in the print, which would make sure. it darker. And so when the lab got it, they didn't understand what we did with the set. All the sets were painted black and white and gray, and everybody wore black and white and gray. There was no color to <laughs> to, 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 to saturate. Get. Yeah. There's no color for them to see what kind of movie that we were making. So when we got it, it was it's all pink. <laughs> it was all pink. And when we saw the first one, I go, there's no color to, to take off of. We don't know. We said, no, this, the movie is shot. Everything in the movie is black and white. So we can, we wanted to make a black and white movie, but shoot it in color. And the studio went, you know, you couldn't sell a black and white movie. So we said, why don't we just make the movie in front of the camera all black and white? So we spray painted the grass gray. We took it, we all the milk bottles, all the ketchup bottles had gray paint in them. If you look, every single thing in that movie was a 10. We carried a 10 gray color chart on our belts. And so we would say, pick number four to do the bed spray. Do number five, do the shoes. So every single thing in that movie was was out of ten, one being almost white and ten being black. Wow! So you basically color graded in camera. Yeah, in camera. <laughs> oh, on, on set, on set, actually. Yeah, on set. yeah. And so when they filmed it, we were watching. When we would watch it, you were looking at a black and white movie, except for the skin tones of the people. You mm-hmm. would see a sort of a blushy blush, but that's all the color. That was it. Yeah, and you did the. We for, did a. Yeah, we shot. One of the opening shots is the American flag that we had sewn in black and white, and the stars are white, and the blue is black, and the red is gray. And that flag flew over the state of a part of Montana. And when you when you photograph it, it looks black and white. I mean, and for and for people who don't know what bleach bypass is, it's the process that um, uh, Fincher did on Seven to get those darks, yeah. re, like the blacks, just pitch black. And yeah. but then he crunched it. Yeah. Did he? Do, I don't. Did they? They didn't do DI. Yeah. There was no DI then. He did it all. In the lab, I think back then. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, and one one last uh, one last question before I get to, to uh, a few. My, my, I always ask the same last questions to everybody. Yep. So, but one curious question I have: Why did you change your name as the director on "Stay Cool and Smell of the Success"? Oh, that, those were those were my my um, my the movies that when. You, you know you're in good company, just like when you find financing falls through. Mm-hmm. When you don't get the cut that you want, you, 
when you don't get the cut you want, you you take your name you, off the move. You Alan Smithy did. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So, but you did those two back to back, so you had two bad experiences. I did two weeks of yeah. It was two. It was two years of my life that you um, were two really special movies. There were two really special movies, and they were expensive to make. And hell of a cast on the, both of them. When we yeah, when we sold them both, the minute we finished, we sold them. The one premiered at Sundance. One premiered at Tribeca. Mm-hmm. Um. IFC, IFC Films, which wanted them both, and there was another company at the same time. Both them, we had the financier, the production company wanted to hold out for a bigger offer, and I said, you know, the success of these movies is going to be distributed, and so we got in a big debate of, is it better to have a movie released or to make the money up front and never or never see it or have a movie released? And they'd be able to be credible to make more movies. And if this, this is a brand new production company, and they wanted to, they just had different ideas. And and I understand that they had different ideas, but at the end of the day, this this was my I think it was my sixth and, or sixth and seventh film or seventh and eighth film. I had an, I had a really good understanding of what was going to happen if they didn't sell fast. They would look like these movies weren't doing well. There was a failure, and it's better to have a perception in Hollywood since it runs on perception that these films are sold and they're coming out as opposed to holding on for two years, seeing if you're going to get a better offer. And they said, well, we'll get a better offer if we go in and recut these movies. And I said, well, you guys said, if you're going to get a better offer, then you go for it. And so I actually, before I removed my name, I watched what they wanted to do. And I said, go ahead. And I, I watched the movies back and I said, all right, if you're gonna have screenings for it with that cut, go for it. We didn't. There wasn't an offer. There wasn't an offer for the for those movies for an, a year, and then I said, "Well, go back to the original cut because you have an offer mm-hmm. on these mm-hmm. movies." And because I, you know, because we proved to be right, it wasn't right to be proved them wrong. You know, it wasn't. So we and so they sat on the movies and released them for. I mean, it was one of those. Um, tragedies of films that we've seen you know, with other filmmakers too but but let me ask you though at the at the level you were at when you made these two movies wouldn't you and i'm assuming the budgets i mean they weren't like a hundred million dollar no. movies or even 20 million dollar movies wouldn't you get final cut or wouldn't yeah. you negotiate final cut yeah we negotiated final cut but but it's when you're dealing with attorneys that can sue you for sitting on a park bench for doing nothing you know you have you can start picking fights and what their idea was, what they claim was, you had final cut if it's sold. And so if they didn't want to make it, meaning they didn't, if they didn't accept the deal, it didn't sell. Oh, so that was their, that was their loophole. Their loophole was you have final cut and yeah, you have a deal and we could sell it. So you keep final cut, but if we don't sell it, it's not selling. So we're going to recut it. So it was one of those fighting, you know, disasters that you, you walk into saying, "Yeah, I have final cut," but if it doesn't sell, obviously there's a problem. But and you did two, not one, because normally you hear that story with one movie, but yeah. you had two. Back yeah, to back. it was a it was a, two years of just taking it on the chin. I mean, taking it everywhere, actually. <laughs> I understand what you mean, sir. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, with that said, can you talk a little bit about your latest film, Hotbot, which I hear? Well, Hot, yeah, Hotbot. We made right after Big Sur, and it was a screenplay that we had it. A, for a while and it was it was sort of a homage to weird science mm-hmm. and it was to be a small million dollar feature that we were going to go shoot and really have a lot of fun and it we did we had a lot of fun with that movie because it was just two goofy teenagers getting a sex robot way before it was hip way before the scarlett johansson robot came out yesterday you know way before it was, it was years ago i mean we did this three years ago and um it was it was fun it almost it didn't run the same risk as as um, the two movies we're speaking just about. It, what happened was um, we decided to – they wanted to get a, a true theatrical, and it was going to be a day-on-date movie. And so they just waited for that perfect timing and went on and went on and went on. Um, I don't think the distributor was happy with how, how they were going to release it and what they were going to put behind it. So there was a lot of – turmoil about how you were going to release a movie like that um 
how, but having said that, it wasn't that kind of experience. It wasn't the same experience. It's the, the movies is the movie, and it came out. I think it came out a little late. I mean, actually, it came out way late. Um, but then that's the type of movie that can stick around, and it doesn't have. It, somebody will always discover it. So I, I didn't have. I didn't have too much precious feelings about it. It was it was a fun exercise. It was fun to shoot, and the kids in it were a lot of fun. Yeah, it looked like from the trailer. It looks like a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So what um, what final advice can you give young filmmakers venturing out on their first feature film? Make decisions and that you can ultimately correct. Because if you don't make a decision, you're just going to be like most of everybody looking at what do I want to do or how I want to do it. You know, I believe a director is, for, 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 for a better word, is mainly a coach, not so much. They have to keep the stamina of everybody going, and especially independent films are based on relationships, not so much money. Although money starts and stops your production, what keeps it going are the days you don't have money. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. So you really have to be the person behind that builds that relationship with that crew that allows them to give you what you need and get everybody to do the exact same thing at the exact same time when you call action. And that is somewhat of being a coach in that term. Um, you know, as a football analogy, to get all those different personalities together on the line to say hi, that's pretty brilliant. To not move, everybody stand still mm-hmm. until I say, I mean, that to me is like movie making. To get all these people just to shut up stop yep uh, you know you're absolutely right you're absolutely, it's it's like yeah, wet cats. Yeah. <laughs> you are it's the best position to be in and the worst position to be in at the same time because it's it's controlled chaos everybody wants to be in that position but very few people know what to do once they get there uh-huh. yeah and, 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 and then thrive under those conditions because day one to day 30 um you spent everything you've got inside and out and you've got to act like it was day one. I was going to ask you real quick. With that, with that being said, um, the whole mumblecore, Mark Duplass, Joe Swansburg kind of films. What are your, what's your vibe on those? What are your, what's your opinion on those kind of films that just got filmmakers that just go out with whatever camera they have and? I mean, Mark Duplass. Yeah, Mark Duplass. Excuse me. I, I say oh, Duplass. Yeah. He's, he's, he's. Close. I mean, I love that kid. <laughs> I mean, I call him. I love. I love him to death just because we've we've run we've crossed paths so many times in our careers. Um, we're not that unsimilar about the way we've done our movies and the way we financed it. He is consistently going down the path that I kind of go back and forth with, um, meaning I've done higher films and lower films, but and I do quite different genres back to back. But Mark has just been somebody I've always admired and I uh, have a good relationship with, and you know, there's nothing bad I can say about somebody who's actually kicking butt all the time. And his wife, too. His wife is tremendous. And his brother's now killing it on uh, trans... Is it Trans America? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, transparent. Transparent? The, yeah. the Amazon show. Uh-huh. As, a, as an actor now, as well. Yeah. Jay. Jay, yeah, Jay as well. It's And did you, like, when you saw Puffy Chair, obviously. Yeah. It's, like, I watch Puffy Chair, and I'm just like... Because you're, t- you're taught in film school that everything needs to look like perfect you have to make yeah. the production value and you have to do this and that yeah. and these guys just grabbed a camcorder and went and shot a movie yeah like they don't care about sound they didn't care about anything but the story was good yeah yeah that's 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 the fabric of a good movie it's just getting that story down and you know execution's always going to be judged even when you make something that's yeah. beautiful to look at, people will say, oh, I still didn't like the way this looked. And you're like, they, mm-hmm. they really spent time doing that. And there's some people that say, I, I don't spend time. I just want to make, I, I want to see the acting and the story. And people say, I didn't like the way it looked, but God, that was a funny movie. Or that was a really well acted movie. And I think the look of a movie has a free pass if the story's great. I think, I mean, I actually have a podcast coming out, uh, I, or just by this time this airs, it already had come out about um, basically telling filmmakers like no one cares what you shot your movie on, and a lot of people are like oh I shot it on the red or I shot it on the Alex. I'm like uh, you could shoot it on your iPhone. Is yeah. the story is your story good? Yeah. That's what matters. Is okay. is the story good? You're absolutely right. I think you do get a pass visually and even auto audio as well yeah. if you've got a good story. And those are so rare, aren't they? They're really. 
they're rare. I'm I'm working on a picture right now where the you know the writing is fantastic. I'm working on Speed the Plow with D- David Mamet's play that I'm adapting <laughs> into a movie. He's done okay. He he writes okay. Oh, you see <laughs> you see what he's you see his words and you go. What's wonderful about David is you just say his words. You don't have to do anything. Just let them come out of your mouth and you are there. And that's remarkable with David's work. Mamet just has that ability to, you don't have to put any touches on his words. You don't have to bring them up, down, polish them, whatever you want. You just say them and they are in Mamet. You're Mamet now. You're Mamet, exactly. Like, like a Tarantino, like you're Tarantino. Yeah. Now. It's like there's a, yeah. that voice. It's so crisp and clear. Yeah. And yeah. and it's non. You can't confuse it. Yeah, it's great. Writers have the tact it like Kerouac when I did Big Sur. You, it was a definitely Kerouac piece because of the way he he was a language he was a language spinner. He was able to spin language in a way that was unique at the time, and it was a a train of thought that was recorded that was unique for a generation, which you know. Probably other bloggers of today do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you with uh, the last few questions I have, which I ask all of my all of my. These are the toughest questions, so I ask all okay. of my guests this. If, if, they're, if they're not timed, then it's gonna be okay. Better. Not timed at all. <laughs> um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Well, I don't know if this 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 the lesson that took me the lo- longest to learn was um, don't be so fucking precious. <laughs> Oh man, that is a lesson most filmmakers need to learn in a big, big yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. Don't be so precious about because that preciousness is what has you hawking that same script well, since 1995. It, yeah, and it will, it will, it'll kill you. It'll kill the spirit. It'll kill your spirit. It'll kill your wife's spirit. It'll kill your kid's spirit. It'll kill your dog's spirit because you're going to start defending a piece of art just to defend it, whether it's right or wrong. You're going to start defending it and make choices based on that. That's probably m- might not make the film happen or make the film not that great. That's a great lesson to learn. And my God, if, if most filmmakers coming out of school or, or just starting out would learn that lesson, man. God, I mean, I've had so many, I mean, I've, I've, I've been in post for about 20 years, so I've had so many filmmakers walk through my doors and my God, <laughs> <it's> some, <laughs> you know, you never know a filmmaker or a human being more than you do when you're in a in a dark room with them for eight hours, ten hours at a time for weeks yeah. on it. Oh, you yeah. It's you know these families that we create are the traveling circus families of today, and it's just different personalities for months on end. And yep, you don't see them for two years, and then you're back in bed with them again. It's the, it's the, it's carnies. Yeah. It's carnies. Yeah. It's it's something that people don't understand. Like we are kind of like carnies in that sense because you do you like and it's weird what you, you make such intense relationships being a director yeah. being a filmmaker with your crew that you literally can not see them for five years yeah. and then hey you want to come back to work with me and the second you see them it's like not a day has gone by yeah and you you see you talk to your crew you see your crew way more than you've seen your family for the rest of your life you spend 18 hours mm-hmm. a day with most of these brothers and sisters <laughs> It's intense, and um, it, it's, a, it's a great bond when it works really, really well. And then you don't have to see him for two years because you spent more time than those two years apart in one in one film. <laughs> <laughs> in one three in one two month period or something like that. So, um, and then what are three of your favorite films um, of all time? In, in no particular say, order. Maybe not my all the favorites, the, the influential ones, the ones I remember. I would say seeing Once More Time in America was a film that influenced me because it it wasn't the Godfathers it, it, and it wasn't it it was the Jewish Mafia and how it, and it was a, it was wonderful to watch James Woods and Robert, Robert De Niro at very young ages do duel it out on a, on a, on this movie it was just beautiful to watch it was authentic it, that was the, yeah and that was his his foray yeah in America and. And it just taught me a lot about um, music and cinematography and, and why I felt and why, you know, actually why I didn't understand the movie, why I didn't understand, why, what was the depth of it that I didn't get? And the symbol in the, what was the symbolism, the religious symbolism all throughout the film and where was he coming from? And I think that was one of those movies I look back on going, wow, that was something. I, 
and I, they're all childhood films in a way because they were so impressionable. And I probably see Close Encounters of the Third Kind was one of those films, which was just a stroke of genius to have the suspense that he that he built around these um, these these foreigners that we call aliens and how they would come in and out of the world and be in our daily lives and and attach ourselves to that to that was was wonderful to watch as a kid it was just wonderful i mean you watch jaw, jaw still holds up yeah those, i would say those two are on the same feeling mm-hmm. same level as i would say i could interchange those all the time um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor and now back to the show and then i know the third one hasn't been made yet wow very great answer i like that answer it's still coming. It's still coming down yeah. the line. Yeah. Um, so where can people find you, Michael? In Montana? <laughs> Online, sir. Online. Oh. Like Twitter, oh, yeah. website. My name. My name. <laughs> I, didn't, I wasn't asking for your I home know. address. <laughs> but it's, a big, it's a big state. It is. It's a it big is. state. It's, there's more cows than people, though. Oh, yeah. There definitely are. There's more. Um, <laughs> there's still under a million people in that whole state. Yeah. It was... Um, I was thinking a lot about it today because Merle Haggard passed away this morning, and oh, wow. and and he had a great song called "Big City," and it was about leaving everything behind and being dumped off in Montana. So, um, you know, my blessings go out to him and his family because he was such a great iconic. You know, he had something like seventy nine top ten hits in the top ten or seventy three, I think it was seventy three top ten hits. Yeah, it's ridiculous. That's more than Lady Gaga. I'm joking. <laughs> I know. I mean, all she wanted to do was have a duet right, with him. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, but you can find me on Twitter. It's a bit, you know, my I'm on Instagram. The same name is Twitter. Michael Dash you know. Polish. Yeah. Well, yeah. Michael. Um, underscore. Yeah. Under, Michael underscore Polish is for usually both of them. Got it. Um, or yeah. is you can find them on both. Or yeah, I think they're both. And do you have a website at all or no? No. Mm-mm. I have your website now. You can find me on Alex. <laughs> you can find him on Indie Film Hustle, which will now yeah. will live will live uh, all, all of it. Yeah. Now that's that's your calling card now. Like, oh, I don't know. Just go to Indie Film Hustle. Look my name up. All my contact information is there. He's right there, right in the corner. <laughs> Michael if anybody's, look, yeah, if anybody's looking for Michael Paul, I just have that arrow. <laughs> Michael, man, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, man. Thanks, man. Really, really, thank you so much. Appreciate man. it. Keep up the good work, and you're, you know, you're doing a good job for the community. I appreciate it, man. Hope you guys picked up some knowledge on that one, man. I was ask. I hope you guys appreciate. I was asking him all those questions. I was really grilling him about all the technical stuff, cause I and even some of the business stuff, cause I was really uh, curious to see how he was able to do everything he did on for Lovers Only. So if you guys haven't had a chance to check that out, um, I'm gonna put a link to not only that, but a bunch of his other movies as well as his amazing book, The Declaration of Independent Filmmaking which I've since read, and it is a really, really, really good book for independent filmmakers. It, it's a great, I would rank it up there with Rebel Without a Crew, uh, Robert Rodriguez's book, uh, which I'll also put in the links uh, in the show notes, because uh, it was a really great book and really shows you a passionate uh, group of filmmakers trying to make their movies, and they throw a lot of lessons out about how it really is and what you need to do to make a movie. So definitely check that out. The show notes are, of course, at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash zero sixty nine. So once again, thank you, Michael Polish, for being on the show. Uh you are an inspiration. Thank you for showing us that we can do it. <laughs> no matter what. Just a good story, a camera, and a dream. And you can go make something happen. As always, guys, head over to filmmakingpodcast.com, filmmakingpodcast.com and leave us a good review for the show. It really helps us out a lot. And I've been getting a lot of uh notes, emails uh, letters from uh, the tribe and uh, of of encouragement of thank yous of you know the, how much the show means to them and how much the the website means to you guys and I really man I, from the bottom of my heart thank you so much for being loyal listeners of the show and it really humbles me every time I get these letters and, and these emails so please keep them coming it keeps me going you know it really does keep me going and I do have a bunch of uh, stuff I'm working on 
uh, some exciting stuff that I'm going to be bringing you guys in the next coming weeks. Uh, I am working heavily in the lab, uh, as they say, to uh, to bring out some very cool stuff. And I'm going to be doing some very experimental stuff moving forward in the feature film world uh, coming up soon. So I will keep you guys abreast of that as it comes goes forward. So as always, guys, thank you very, very much for being uh, just being you guys. <laughs> Thanks, guys, so much. Keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.